pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, special forum on the budget for all uh, ballot question. Really proud to uh, be sponsoring this event, and, uh, hosting this event in Northampton. And I want to thank all of the sponsors, um, including uh, the American Friends Service Committee, the Northampton Democratic City Committee, the Northampton Committee to End the Wars, First Churches Peace and uh, Justice Committee, the Massachusetts Green Rainbow Party, the Alliance to Develop Power, Arise for Social Justice, National Priorities Project, uh, Western Mass Jobs with Justice, Alliance for Peace and Justice, Progressive Democrats of America, <laughs> Jim Carpenter out there, uh, <laughs> Civil Liberties and Public Policy Program, Grace Church Peace Fellowship, Western Mass Fund, Our Communities Not War, Holyoke City Councilor Aaron Vega, uh, Climate Action Now, Pioneer Valley Jesus Peace Fellowship, uh, Northampton City Councilor Jesse Adams, Northampton City Councilor Pamela Schwartz, Move On Western Massachusetts, Pioneer Valley Green Rainbow Party, Population and Development Program at Hampshire College, Can't Be Neutral, uh, uh, well, there's a couple that I've already mentioned, Occupy Amherst Schools in Solidarity, and the Lever Peace Commission. So thank you to all of this is a really important issue as the mayor of a, of a city. Uh, cities and towns, uh, budget is sort of the foundation of what we do in terms of uh, making difficult choices and delivering the key services, and it really speaks to the values, our values as a community. And in recent years, we've struggled with the amount of resources that we've had to work with. I'm really proud that in uh, 2010, I wasn't the mayor, I was still a member of the city council. Uh, we were among one of the first communities in the nation uh, to pass a resolution. Um, it, was a, it was a bring dollars home resolution, but the principal focus of it was to not only end the war in Afghanistan, support our troops, and provide the services for our troops and veterans, but also to reinvest those dollars in things that we need here at home, uh, in our roads, in our public works, in our education, in public safety, uh, social services, etc. And so this, this budget for all uh, really follows along in that same vein. And we're really fortunate tonight to have some of our uh, federal and state leaders, as well as uh, um, uh, Joe Comfort from uh, National Priorities Project, uh, to talk with us about it. So I want to introduce our moderator uh, for tonight, um, uh, who's going to be uh, introducing the topic and then switching over to the forum, and that's Jeff Napolitano from the American Friends Services Committee. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and a particular thank you to Mayor Narcos. Mm -hmm. um, we are here to listen and to speak out about an upcoming referendum question, which will be on the ballot here in the Pioneer Valley in Amherst, Granby, Hatfield, Holyoke, Montgomery, Pelham, Northampton, Southampton, and Westhampton, and in nearly two dozen cities and towns in Berkshire County, as well as dozens of cities and towns in the Boston area. The question, in short, asks if you wish to prevent cuts to our fundamental social security uh, safety net, rather. Whether you wish to create and protect jobs through investments in traditional areas like manufacturing, schools, and housing, but also in green, renewable energy. Whether you want to provide new revenue through raising taxes on the rich, closing tax loopholes, and offshore tax havens, and whether you want to redirect military spending away from the disastrous wars and the bombing that our country does overseas, finally bringing home all the U.S. troops out of harm's way. These are not merely questions on the ballot, but are in fact the substance of one of the three serious budgets that have been proposed in Washington, D.C. This budget, called the Budget for All, has been put out by the largest congressional caucus, the Progressive Caucus. It calls for doing all of these things that I just listed, and doing them better than the other budgets in contention, Representative Bryan's budget and President Obama's budget requests. This is not merely a bureaucratic report, but it is a very special thing, an idea whose time has come, as Representative Lee once said. Uh, it is a concrete, pragmatic way forward, not a high in the sky fantasy but an articulate and quantifiable first step towards a more humane country that puts the needs of people ahead of profit. Our national budget, what all our tax dollars fund, is a moral document, as Representative Lee 
said, and it is where our country puts its money where our, its mouth is. Unfortunately, for a long time now, our country has been putting its money toward its death and destruction, setting aside social uplift and the needs of our people, and ignoring the ecological disaster that our current way of life has been producing. Dr. King declared over 45 years ago that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. He spoke about this country 45 years ago. Look at this piece of paper. And you can get copies of it in the lobby at the AFC table. This is the federal budget, 2013. This represents what we spend our money on collectively. It represents the moral document of our country. You can't really discern the education spending from the health and human services, from the agricultural budget, from way down there. But I'm sure that you can see the big red stripe, right? Everybody can see this big red part right here. That budget goes to war, the Department of Defense, and nuclear weapons. A slice of it represents the budget for veterans' affairs, which no one will contest as a worthy and necessary way to spend our money. But the lion's share of this budget, of this 60% goes towards spiritual doom, in the words of Martin Luther King. And it is time to reverse that trend. We have in the audience Haki Wheelan, who returned recently from Pakistan and Waziristan, where she went on a peacemaking trip with 40 other US citizens to protest the policy of drone, drone attacks in that region, and to visit with the families and the victims of the families um, of their indiscriminate drone attacks. Drones, whose optical systems were designed in this very city, have been killing people in Pakistan and Waziristan for quite some time. Surely we can agree to spend our tax dollars on saving lives, not ending them. In Springfield on Friday, people came together on Calhoun's Drive in the home of the Mendez family, who was being foreclosed upon. Despite their street being littered with empty houses, despite the Mendez's family's desire and ability to pay rent, and despite a lack of anyone actually interested in living in their home, the bank wanted them out. Now it turns out that we had enough people who sat down, who risked arrest, and who said no, that the bank was compelled to cancel the eviction. But there are hundreds of families in Springfield this year who won't have that same support. Surely if we can find enough money to give hundreds of billions of dollars to banks, we can find money to support the victims of those banks. Surely we can divert a little bit of our national budget towards uplifting those who have fallen behind. So how do we reverse the trend that we're on? Well, the Budget for All campaign started well over a year ago when peace groups from all over the state came together to try to identify how, as separate organizations and coalitions spread across the Commonwealth, to begin to affect the discussion in our country on a national level. And while we recognize that our influence as separate groups is limited, we can at least come together in this state and advance this question, the question of whether we're going to spend our way towards spiritual doom or social uplift. And the question is on the ballot in much of the Pioneer Valley this November, among other places. A vote for the budget for all is a vote for a progressive budget, a budget that begins to turn the ship of the federal budget towards human needs. And it has begun in Massachusetts, and when it passes, it will signal that Massachusetts, the state, wants a better way of life. And we hope it will spread across the country so that we can have a serious, pragmatic conversation in the halls of power and say to those in Washington that it is time to focus on social uplift, not spiritual doom. We will hear from supporters of our referendum, and then we will have an opportunity for you in the audience to come to the microphones on the floor and be heard. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge the folks before we bring up our next speaker that are, that are here to speak. Um, we have uh, Representative Peter Koka. <laughs> Representative Alan Story. Yeah. Um, we have Congressman uh, Jim McGovern. <laughs> we have City Councilor Aaron Vega.
To do that, we have perhaps the best person possible to lay it up for us. Please welcome Joe Comfort, the executive director of the
tax cuts for the wealthy is 2%. That's individuals making more than 200,000, families making more than 250,000. Right? That's very similar to the Obama administration. Then it goes a little bit further, right? It says we're going to raise tax rates um, and we're going to bring on five new tax brackets for billionaires and uh, millionaires. Um, we're going to tax capital gains as ordinary income and we're going to raise the tax uh, ceiling for Social Security. This is all about increasing the pie, if you will, increasing the amount of money that our federal legislators like Congressman McGovern have at their discretion to spend. Right? It goes against the grain of the myth that our nation is broke. Right? When we start to look at, at numbers like this, just the tax, new tax brackets and capital gains would mean that over 10 years, this budget for all would increase the revenue pie by $1 trillion. That's just the new taxes. Right? Then in terms of corporations, it actually says, okay, we're going to stop the preferential treatment for fossil fuel companies, close some other loopholes, um, the Wall Street gaming tax and imposes a price on carbon emissions, right? Um, so here are the ways in which the budget for all is thinking about increasing the pie. Then when we look at how the Obama administration and Ryan, Congressman Ryan's budget uh, shape up, we see, we see the differences in their assumptions about what's going to work for our nation and the differences between themselves and their ideologies what they value um, in terms of the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget. Again, so President Obama also wants to see the taxes for the wealthiest, 2%, to sunset, right? We have the opportunity to see them sunset on December 31st of this year, um, when those taxes can, can go away. Uh, also closing loopholes and is uh, levies a financial crisis responsibility fee. Uh, Congressman Ryan actually replaces our tax brackets um, uh, and chooses two, 10 and 25%. So he's lowering the bar, and he's also going to lower corporate tax rates from 35% to 25%. Now, the tricky part of uh, Congressman Ryan's vision is that already, because of loopholes, corporations don't pay 35%, right? right? They pay, on average, depending on the year, 20 to 22%, right? Because they, they're uh, privileged by some uh, givebacks and loopholes. So we're all, if we ratchet that bar down to 25%, we know that it's actually going to go lower. So in Congressman Ryan's vision, the pot uh, with which our legislators, or from which our legislators can dip and draw and prioritize their spending um, diminishes, right? Because he's a small government guy. Um, let's think about the budget for all and jobs. Another major concern in our nation still, really, from the economic crisis. Uh, so in this, uh, this budget really distinguishes itself uh, from the other budgets. 2.9 trillion over 10 years. It does it a couple of different ways. In some direct spending um, and, and job stimulus. And then it also makes investment in what's called non-defense discretionary spending. Now, there are two types of discretionary spending, which is just as its name sounds, at the discretion of the President and Congress. So every year, President Obama, since he's been in office, proposes a discretionary spending budget that is known in these two halves, defense and non-defense. So the budget for all says we're going to stimulate jobs by shoring up this non-defense discretionary budget, which are things like spending on education, renewable energy, research and development, affordable housing, community development block grants, and by shoring that up, we stimulate jobs. Right? So now, uh, then in Medicare, uh, like President Obama's budget, um, they're seeking administrative efficiencies, right? This is a very big difference between uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget and President Obama's budget and, and Congressman Ryan's budget. So they're seeking some administrative uh, changes and efficiencies that will save money over time, but they're hoping to have those administrative changes um, be born and carry the savings by the corporations, by the insurance providers, whereas uh, Congressman Ryan is looking to actually um, uh, have an impact on the beneficiaries directly. So very, very different in the, the approach. Um, also, the Congressional Progressive Caucus in the Budget for All is going to lower prescription drugs um, by negotiating with drug providers. Um, so in terms of the Obama administration's budget, also President Obama is proposing $350 billion through job, for job creation, largely through infrastructure, um, and uh, 
congressman behind him is, again, a different ideology, a different set of assumptions. Um, he is going to generate economic, or he proposes to generate economic activity through tax cuts and eliminating governmental regulations. So that's, again, the, the way he thinks he's going to get that done. And then, uh, of course, Medicare, uh, President Obama also seeking to make Medicare more efficient. It will save money, so he is talking about cuts, but it's cuts to providers and profit, not to beneficiaries. Uh, Congressman Ryan is talking about a voucher system in 2023 um, that would ultimately private, privatize, along with privatizing Medicare um, and allow and, and uh, making seniors compete for insurance on the private market. Um, so let's think specifically at military. Um, so uh, in these lines, line graphs, the, the red arrow talks, shows where the budget for all is going to come out in 10 years. Um, so the budget for all says we are going to have to reduce core military spending. We're going to have to do that through cuts to nuclear weapons. Um, we're going to have to do that through conventional forces, which we think of that as force structure, the size of our troops, where they're placed. Um, and the numbers of troops that who are in the field. Um, we're, they're also going to make a greater um, investment in the Veterans Administration, uh, something that the Veterans Administration has been calling for nationally to meet the demand. Um, ending war spending uh, beginning in 2014, so you'll notice if you read the budget for all that they have to increase uh, the military budget in 13 to get people out safely, so they're thinking about that. Um, and over 10 years, uh, this budget for all will spend $733 billion less uh, than the Ryan budget and $135 billion less than the Obama budget on core military. Um, so, so then, right, so this is how we're going to spend the money. And finally, um, let's think about deficits. We all care about deficits. It's, it's actually fine to talk about deficit. We want to. We want to leave our children with a healthy, uh, a healthy government, a healthy economy, and one of the things that we have to think about is deficit. It turns out that, um, and debt, the aggregated debt, it turns out that the budget for all um, does fares far better um, with deficit. Um, ultimately, the red line, the red arrow is pointing to the budget for all. Uh, it, that's 2022, and the budget for all um, remains in deficit, but not nearly as large in deficit as, for example, uh, the Ryan budget. Um, which is it struggles because Congressman Ryan maintains a commitment to military spending while cutting um, uh, cutting taxes, and so his budget does not fare well for our economy, our government, in terms of deficit over time. So uh, those are just the snapshots. These are competing visions for the United States, and the budget for all represents uh, a more progressive vision for our nation. So thank you.
uh, with Massachusetts Beats uh, Network and Pat Solomon. And yes, it's true, the two of us in uh, 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 transfer stations, at uh, supermarkets, at farmers markets, uh, got the question on the ballot. Uh, I had already secured my ballot line, uh, but I thought it was very important, both as part of my campaign and, uh, and everything else, to give voters in the 4th Berkshire District a, a choice. So when we gathered the signatures and we talked about the, the budget issues at the federal government that mirrors what I talk about at the state government, uh, people responded extremely favorably. And when, learned, when they learned that in November they could vote for a state rep representative who was going to be loud on the issue of fair taxes and fair budgets on Beacon Hill, they were even more delighted. So the voters in the 4th Berkshire District, which is over 20 towns, almost two dozen, will have two choices, uh, two opportunities to cast their vote for a fair budget. And I'm proud to be part of that and proud to work with uh, Pat Solomon on that effort. Thank you very much. Woo! We have a friend from Holyoke, Holyoke City, City Councilor Aaron Vega, who is also running for state rep. It's a real honor to be up here uh, with all the state reps and the congressmen. Uh, so I'll be brief. Uh, I'm excited to be here representing Holyoke because, uh, as you all know, Holyoke is on the rise, and I think that it's time that Holyoke is represented once again as part of the valley. Um, Woo! What this budget for all does is it sends a strong message to the legislators, both at the state level and the national level, as to what the priorities are. And I think that this is important, even though you've already heard that, because there's often that lack of communication for us as constituents to let our legislators know what we're interested in. Um, you hear a lot of talk about taxing the rich and doing this and doing that, and I think those are all things that we talk about, because when you start talking about a long-term tax plan that's fair, equitable, and sustainable, not just for next year, but for five years and ten years down the road, which is exactly what this plan starts to do, we need to stop creating budgets that are for votes. Start creating budgets that are going to get people elected, and start creating budgets that are going to fix this country and fix this city. I think that this is a great plan because it's starts to create smart spending, reinvest in education, reinvest in infrastructure. I think what I've seen over my lifetime is probably the worst thing that this country has done, is create healthcare, education, and trash as profitable entities. And I think that's a total <laughs> And I just want to add a couple of things to what you heard today. These are our values of community, but also I think of humanity. When we talk about this as a bigger scope, this is not just about us in Massachusetts, even though we like to always think it's about us, don't we? But um, it's about humanity on a whole. I think that this is about reinvesting not only the money here, but reinvesting the money across the country so that we can start creating jobs across this country once again, start making things here once again, and supporting local economies. And then I have to just end by saying that these tax dollars not only save lives, as what was said earlier, but enhances lives. We need to make sure we have a strong safety net. That's very important. We need to make sure we have the path for people to get out of that safety net, to get the job created, to get the job training, to get the education, and to get the health care that they need. So very proud to represent Hoyoke here tonight, and uh, look forward to working with all of you to uh, work on this and other great things here for the Valley. So thank you all. Next up, we have from the 3rd Hampshire District, uh, Representative Ellen Story.
And I am so afraid if I wake up on November 7th and the wrong people have won, I fear for us. I fear for all of us. I fear for my six and three quarters year old granddaughter and the rest of us. So I am hoping so much that that does not happen. I served with Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is not interested. He's not interested. He wants to play the part of a governor, but he's not that interested. He, we have very few Republican legislators when he was governor. He didn't even know their names. They disliked him intensely. And with Scott Brown, I served with him in the House as well, and then when he moved to the Senate. The only time that he came to the State House was when we had a roll call vote. That's the only time your constituents know whether you are there or not. And when he was there, he was up in his office doing a real estate closing. He was not paying attention. He's not interested. So we all, we have until Wednesday to register everybody who needs to be registered. Uh, and we all need to do everything we can so that we can work toward, we have a chance of working toward something like a budget for all. Did any of you read in the paper about the Dalai Lama being in Boston? Yeah. He just spoke um, at a big Boston hotel, and he said wonderful, wonderful things uh, that I wish we could follow. They all are in line.
First of all, this public policy question that they will talk about tonight really has very little to argue with. Um, later on tonight, we can talk about life after the wars in the context of Congress's uh, next moves on cuts and taxes. Um, so let me explain sort of what the Massachusetts example uh, is in terms of dealing with these sorts of crises. There are five basic parts. Cuts, reorganize, reform, save, and capitalize in the good stuff. First of all, we made broad cuts to save those programs that were the most critical. And this process never stops, by the way. As I said, we were faced with a $3 billion shortfall. In fact, this, this year, we continued this process of analysis. We passed a new law which mandates that every state agency pursue performance-based audits on all of their, their programs, making sure that we keep what works and change those programs that are not productive. This process will carry over into performance audits of tax breaks next year. We have improved our transparency of and access to our government programs so that the public can easily navigate regulatory mandates and state resource opportunities. Second, we made systematic far-reaching changes to our pension system, health care laws, ethics, lobbying, and transportation laws, literally saving billions of dollars over the next 10 years. And there's tons of research showing that that number is probably conservative. Third, we prudently use one-time funding, such as stimulus funds, the a ARRA funds, and capital gains proceeds. Now when capital gains are up, we carve off a big chunk and we save it. Most of the ARRA funds went into construction projects, and our stabilization fund is now close to $1.5 billion, and we are one of only a handful of states that have a stabilization fund of that magnitude. Fourth, we have concentrated on promoting and expanding those knowledge-based sectors that have created greater job growth in our state than in any other state except Texas. Biotech, precision manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, green jobs, healthcare, and higher ed. This has led to a robust export market and large investments in public and private R&D in our colleges and private companies. Fifth, we have promoted a well-trained workforce 39% of our population has a bachelor's or higher, which is more than most states and directly translates into a higher wage base. All of the large bond rating agencies on Wall Street, Standard Poor's, Fish's, and Moody's, have acknowledged these measures and successes by raising our bond rating to A++, in contrast to most states that have seen their bond ratings downgraded during this, during this period of time. This makes it cheaper for us to borrow money, freeing up funds for additional programming or infrastructure needs. Woo! What are our challenges right now? We have many, but let me concentrate on a couple. When you look at that job growth that I just talked about, it is not balanced geographically or, around, or, or along skill levels or job groups. For example, Lola and Lawrence have an 11.2% unemployment rate. Fall River and New Bedford, 9.8%. And the areas of North Adams and Pittsfield, Springfield, Holyoke, and Fitzford and Lemster are not far behind and are not sharing the same job growth seen in the Greater Boston area. Outside of healthcare and high tech, most job posts that you see are either for part time work or seasonal work. Our recovery, therefore, is, is in turn fragile and uneven, according to both UMass Amherst and the Fed Bank of Boston. Businesses, by and large, are spending on replenishing stocks and are investing in productivity-enhancing products and services and less on personnel. In 2007, Massachusetts was home to 137,000 construction workers. In 2010, that number is 100,800. That's a drop of 22%. In Western Massachusetts, in this valley, it's estimated that over 30% of building trade workers are unemployed. Construction, traditional manufacturing, and consumer-sensitive sectors continue to underperform. From 2005 to 2010, housing prices fell by 13.7%. As of last year, it's estimated that 15% of all homeowners were underwater on their mortgages. Those traditional paths to the middle class and blue-collar jobs have suffered disproportionately during the past five years. In June of this year, 438,000 mass students residents reported being unemployed or underemployed. Among post-9-11 veterans, 
10% of those veterans that are men are unemployed. 13% of women veterans are unemployed. Our Commonwealth Job Creation Commission put out its recommendations on October 3rd of this year. These include goals of capitalizing on a well-educated workforce as our greatest national resource, building up the capacity of our public colleges to educate, train, and attract uh, new research dollars, and to overcome employment barriers for those seeking to compete in the modern world marketplace. We need to bring new opportunities to those regions that have not seen adequate job growth. This report also concentrates on the so-called middle skill workers and recommends a better coordinated system of workforce training and job search, resource, job search resources and will be complemented by the $5 million recently passed by the legislature for this purpose and $50 million passed in the job creation bill that my colleagues and I voted on last year. We've also included a $1 million pipeline fund to train interns at technology companies. Um, I'm sure that our, our congressman is going to be talking about what's happening in Washington in a minute, and I'd be happy to answer questions after that time. Thank you. So we're going to take um, questions from the audience uh, in just a minute. Change we're talking about with the budget for all 
is probably not going to happen from Washington uh, alone. It is going to be is going to happen because the grassroots, the people of this country, are going to make their voices heard and say enough is enough. It is time to change direction. It is time to put our priorities uh, in order. And you know, Jeff, I want to agree with something Jeff said at the beginning. You know, I believe that budgets. Federal budgets and state budgets and city budgets, they're moral documents. They really are. I mean, they, they tell us what we think is important. You know, they, 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 they tell what we value, um, you know, what our priorities are, what we care about. And when you have budgets that routinely uh, turn a cold shoulder to the poor in this country, you know, make it more difficult for the middle class, Provide big tax cuts to the wealthy and the big corporations, uh, and, and you know, and continue to overinvest in the military budget that is so big that even Doctor Strangelove would be impressed. You gotta wonder what the hell is going on, because I don't believe that the budgets coming out of Washington reflect what the majority in this country believe, and not just Democrats, but I think even in Republicans. I don't, I, I can't believe that this country. Uh, has moved down the path uh, where Paul Ryan wants to take us. Um, a budget that really epitomizes greed and selfishness. Uh, it's cruel. It would, it would create a government that lacks a conscience. Uh, I don't believe that even my Republican friends um, who I serve with really quite understand what his budget would do to this country. Uh, and that's not an America that I want to see. Um, I, 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 you know, I, again, I, I you know, I've had the privilege of serving in Congress since 1996, uh, and I've met, you know, countless people. And uh, I've had people come into my office who have enjoyed great success, and I've cheered them on. And I've had people come into my office who live out of their automobiles. I've had people come into my office looking for food, uh, looking for direction to the closest food bank or food pantry, trying to figure out how they're going to feed their kids. You know, we have tens of millions of people in the United States of America who are hungry, who are hungry. As a congressman, I'm ashamed of that fact. I think everybody should be ashamed of that fact. We're the richest, most powerful country in the world, and nobody, and absolutely nobody in this country should go hungry. Food ought to be a right. Woo! Food ought to be a right. <laughs> he might political hero, my political mentor. He's having, having a tough time uh, uh, battling with some with a recent uh, with a recent illness. But I learned an awful lot from him. And I remember one time being in a debate with him, and the uh, moderator asked him a question about uh, national security uh, and what you know what what his priorities were on national security. And he began to talk about investments in jobs and you know and. Investments in our people and the moderator interrupted and said, I'm sorry, Senator, I'm, I'm asking you uh, a question about national security. So can you stick to the military uh, issues? And he said, No, you asked me a question. You're, yes, you're right. I'm entitled to give the answer that I want to give. And to me, national security is about more than the number of weapons we have in our nuclear arsenal. National security includes where the people have a job, Woo! where the people have enough to eat, Woo! where the people have enough to eat. Woo! People can send their kids to school. There's a quality education. Woo! Uh, you know, uh, national security means the purity of our of the air we breathe and, the, and, and our environment. Yes. Yeah. Woo! And those are things that are also part of national security. Um, and so, you know, the, the the budget for all that we're talking about here is not a pie in the sky, you know, kumbaya dream. Uh, this is this is this to me represents what is the national security interest of the United States of America. This is hard-headed realism, you know? And what it says is that, you know, we ought to reduce the number of nuclear weapons that we have on our soil. Because after all, how many times do you blow up the world? I mean, if we blow up the world 15, is that enough? Okay, you know, so then we look to eliminate half the nuclear weapons on our soil. It costs us billions of dollars each and every year to be able to maintain. You know, we, we talk a lot about the wars that are going on, that went on in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Let me tell you this. I, I, I opposed the war in Iraq, and I have been leading the charge in Congress to get this war in Afghanistan to an end as soon as humanly possible and bring our troops home. Back home. Woo! But here's the deal. To all those who want to send us to war, you know, who get up on the House floor, the Senate floor all the time, and rattle the sabers and say, keep the troops there, it's in our national security interest. You know, I wish they would have the guts to then say to their constituents, but you know what? We're going to ask you to pay for it. Mm -hmm. We're going to tax you for this war. Yeah. Because right now, um, we're not paying for it. And when people talk about our debt, you know, $1.6 trillion of our debt are directly related to the unpaid for co yeah. costs of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, that's a big chunk. I mean, the fact that we're having a debate at the presidential level, and we're not focused on the fact that we've had two unpaid for wars, is stunning to me. I mean, that is one of the reasons why we are up to our neck, a neck in debt. Woo! You want to, want to eliminate that debt? You end these wars, you make, you make this a promise that if you want to go to war again, you have to pay for it. I mean, these, are the war, these wars that we are fighting now are the first wars, I think, since we borrowed money from the French to fight the British, that we're not paid for. Um, you know, it, and what worries me about this kind of trend we're going down is it makes it too easy mm -hmm. uh, for reckless lawmakers uh, to, uh, to go down that path of war because there aren't very many consequences. Because there's no draft, and the, the number of people right now who are serving in harm's way are a small sliver of our population. They and their families, the only ones who are asked to sacrifice, we're not even asked to pay for it. Um, and it makes it too easy for people to want to go to war. It makes me nervous when I hear Ben Romney kind of rattle the sabers about going to war in Iran. It's too easy. Yeah. It's too easy. Um, and, and it becomes so easy that when you look at public opinion polls, when people talk about the top ten issues that are on their mind, the wars don't even make the cut. Um, and I, 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 I find that deeply troubling. Uh, and so if people really want to get serious about getting our budgetary house in order, if they want to get serious about national security, then we need a whole new discussion, a whole new debate in this country. And it's not going to happen um, from Washington. It's going to happen in, in communities like this one and the other communities where this is on the ballot. Um, I'll also just say one other thing. I've, I've been watching these uh, presidential debates and this presidential campaign like all of you have. Um, and I am nervous, um, as Ellen Story is, and you know, uh, Peter Kokot is, and we're all uh, we're all nervous. We're all frightened about you know what if the worst thing happens, and you know, uh, and, and I, I have to tell you, you know, we have some time left. Um, we do, we do need to make sure people are registered to vote. We need to make sure people are talking about the issues. You know, uh, at the presidential level and at the senate level, this is not about who runs the best commercial. Uh, it's not even about, quite frankly, whether Ob Obama was engaged in this debate or not. I don't care whether President Obama was asleep at the podium. He's a hell of a lot better than Mitt Romney ever will be. Yeah. And we can this is about issues. This is about issues. It's about issues. It's about things that affect you and your, and your families. And the budget that the Republicans have been telling in Washington represents an all-time high in recklessness and stupidity. And I am understating the case. Uh, so, so here's the deal. Um, you know, we get a group, uh, you know, called the Progressive Caucus that is, you know, is banded together and we introduce a budget and we debate the budget. We try to put forward some uh, alternatives, but we need to expand our ranks. Um, and the other thing we need to do is we need to make sure that uh, people all throughout the country know what we're doing. Uh, and there ought to be forums like this, quite frankly, in every single city and town in the United States of America. People ought to know what the hell is going on in Washington. They ought to know what, what, what budgets are being debated, what are the issues, what are the priorities. Uh, you know, we, we're getting to the point where we're not having those kind of detailed intelligent discussions. You turn on the news, and it's too much about entertainment and not enough about substance. And as a result, we're not, all these important things are kind of being pushed to the wayside. We need to we need to figure out a way, uh, you know, to, to, to get Washington to become a place where trivial issues are not the only ones that are debated passionately. That are debated passionately. 
we need to make sure that important issues are debated passionately. Woo! Uh, and, with, and, with, and with seriousness and with purpose. Uh, and so, um, so I am I'm, I'm grateful uh, to, uh, to everybody here for, for being here today. And I'll just close with, uh, with this. Um, you know, uh, as bad as sometimes I think things are, um, I am still hopeful. And I'm hopeful um, as a person who has to serve with Paul Ryan and uh, Michelle Bachman and uh, Eric Cantor. I don't want to go depress myself. But I, I, I'm hopeful because I meet people like you um, who never, ever, ever give up. And, you know, it, to me, this is, this, this, you, are, you are the patriots. Uh, in this country. And we need a new activism. We need to have people out there on the streets all across this country uh, and, and demanding that the people of this country, not just the wealthy, not just the elite, not just the big corporations, but the people of this country are treated with a little bit more respect. And that means a budget that reflects the values of this country. Uh, and that's what the, this budget for all is, is about. Uh, and that is why it's so important uh, to get out there and to get people to vote for it. Uh, and let me say, let me just say this one final thing. You vote for it, I get to go back to Washington and say, look at, look what my people have said. Look what my people have given me the, uh, the, the, uh, the backbone to stand up and to fight for. The more people that have resolutions to pass that talk about this budget for all, you're going to find a lot more courageous members of Congress. You're going to find, you know, all of a sudden you're going to find, they're going to find the backbone. They're going to get out there and they're going to start not only talking about this, but fighting for the principles and fighting for the priorities in this budget for all. So you keep on fighting, and I promise you, I'll keep on fighting. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Try the other mic. Uh, my name is Shanti, uh, I live in Sheepsbury, Mass. And uh, my question is 
about uh, the environment and the, the ecological budget. So we're currently in deficit spending ecologically. And uh, uh, everything I can say is great, but um, I want to know how we can increase the focus on the environment. There's been no talk of climate change. There's never talk about species extinction. And we can't eat money, we can't drink money, we can't drink money. The environment is, is our basis of life. So how can we increase that in the budget and for all and in the, the public discourse? Thank you.
concerning Head Start, uh, concerning early Head Start and uh, child care issues, um, I know that with this budget for all that it is actually going to address some of these. Um, and what I want to know from you is how, what kind of help do you need from our small group organization, which is open to new members, um, <laughs> Um, what do you want to see from us constituents for you, and, and are there folks that you'd like us to reach out to for this budget for all? Um, I know we can be um, holding forums in our communities, etc. 